Picking the right product is what it's all about when it comes to private label success. So in today's episode, we're going to go over five tips that you can use every time you're doing private label research to make sure that you're going after a successful private label product. All coming up in this episode of the Amazon Seller Podcast. This is the Amazon Seller Podcast, hosted by multi-million dollar Amazon sellers, helping you launch your private label business to the next level. Find us on amazingfreedom.com or subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and YouTube. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Amazon Seller Podcast. In this video edition, you can listen on audio or on video on YouTube. In today's episode, we're gonna be talking about one of the most important topics in private label, product research, picking products, what to avoid, and what makes up a good product, some general guidelines that might help you as you're going through your product research. So we're gonna hear five tips from Leron today uh, some of the things, some of the criteria that he looks at every time he goes through his private label research. And remember, all three of us are constantly looking for new private label products. We're not um, just stuck on our old products, although we're trying to build up our brands. We're also trying to bring new products in and expand our product lines, which means we need to look at this kind of criteria, some of these guidelines, almost on a daily basis as we go through our private label research. And as we help our members in the inner circle and evaluate product evaluation guides, these are some of the same uh, criteria or tips or guidelines that we look at whenever we're going through those product evaluation guides. Andy, I want to start off by just having you tell us a little bit again about the importance of product research, obviously, uh, you know, how important it is because some people I think underestimate how important it is to really uh, look for the right type of product. And then maybe you can go over just some of the important pieces that you look at personally, and then we'll hear from Lee Ron. Yes, sir. So this is the most important step in the process. The product research portion is where you're going to spend the most time. Uh, it is where you make the most money. And so you really want to become good at finding those potential products. A couple of things I think that are super important just to start off. One, when you're looking for products, obviously, you know, what we suggest is the sales velocity has to be there. And so you have to be able to verify that, again, using the great data that Amazon gives us, you have to be able to verify that the sales velocity is there and that the customer demand is there. Otherwise, you're gonna bring, you're gonna do a lot of work and you're not gonna get any sales and you're gonna lose money. And so we don't wanna work in that type of uh, risk environment. We wanna be able to know that when we bring our product to Amazon, the customers are gonna order it. So that's like the number one thing you have to make sure the sales velocity is there. Andy, can I ask you a question that kind of goes in this? I think, you know, we talk often to people who um, ask us, should you go after a product that you're really passionate about and that you know um, really well, right? Like a topic or area that you know well, um, and kind of use that as your starting point. Should you always go after something that you already know about and that you're passionate about? Oh uh, yeah, not, not, um, uh, not necessarily. And so, you know, a lot of times people will come to us with ideas that they have and they're really dead set that they want to bring this type of product. And so then we'll do a little bit of research and we'll show them the data. Like, look, we're just not seeing where there's customer demand here for this product. And so we see this as more of a high risk venture. If you, if you cannot show us, right, that the uh, raw data that customers are looking for products like this. So that's where you first have to start. And the good thing about that is when you're looking at that data that shows the customer demand is there, if you do make a poor choice um, in picking a product and maybe the product's too saturated, generally, if you've sourced it at a good margin, you're going to break even on that product, maybe make a couple dollars or at the worst, maybe lose a couple dollars. As long as that demand is there, again, use the Amazon data to verify that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, you wanna make sure that you're not picking a product that is ultra saturated. Uh, you'll see this on Amazon when you put in uh, things like uh, kitchen um, silicone sets. If you put that in you know, the Amazon search bar, you're gonna see there's probably about 10 pages of kitchen silicone sets. So that's not a product that you wanna to bring to the Amazon marketplace because there are already too many listings and you're gonna be competing 
uh, for keywords, they're going to cost you a lot of dollars spending on those Amazon ads. So those are my first two suggestions. Make sure the demand is there and then make sure you're not picking a product that's saturated. Awesome. And I think that's something that's good to review all the time, right? Uh, those are some of the important like general underlying principles that we feel are good no matter what you're doing. Um, so that's always good to get a refresher on something that we've talked about before on the show, but I think it's always good to really drill into your mindset as you're going to your product uh, research. Now, Liron, you have a couple, five tips for us that get a little bit more specific on actionable um, pieces of data or information that we can look at. Maybe you can go over what those five pieces of information are that you look at when you're doing your research. Yeah, so the first thing that you want to look at when you're considering um, a private label product and, um, you know, maybe you've done some research and you've written down 20 or 30 ideas that you've come across. Uh, the first thing you want to think about is, um, is this product, is it brand dominated, right? Because you definitely don't want to go up against big brands. And the reason is not because we can't beat the big brands, but because if you're on a, you know, if you're on a, on an Amazon search results page and everybody around you are big brand companies, companies like Nike, Sony, right? Um, Huggies, um, Starbucks, right? Companies in, you know, that, that sell, that are well known and, and are selling, um, you know, under big brand names, then you're going to have a problem getting clicks, right? And your click through rate for that keyword is going to be very, very low. So not only, um, which affects your ranking. So the one, you know, the, the A9 algorithm relies on click throughs and also sales. And so if you're not getting the click throughs on a keyword and then that's not translating into sales, you're not going to end up ranking for that keyword. And so if you're looking at a product and you know, so, um, let's say you're looking at a, let's say, you know, you're looking for whatever reason at a camera, right? I would recommend, even if you have a great source to make the product, et cetera, um, unless you're really, you know, doing like something super innovative that you should not bring that product to market. And the reason is because you're competing against Canon and Nikon and Sony and some major big brands and you're not going to get the clicks, right? So Leron, let me ask you there then for someone who's looking at a product niche, maybe where they're, they're not really sure I mean, we already went over that you don't necessarily have to have a product that you know a ton of, about, right? You, you can follow right. the data on Amazon. So what if you're looking at a niche and you, know, you don't really know a whole lot about the product? So how do you know whether the brand is too big or not? What's kind of your criteria there? Yeah, well, you know, the first thing that I would ask myself is when I think of this product, do I know of, do I know of a brand? So that's one clue. So let's say you don't know. Um, what you should do is you should... Uh, search on Amazon and see who the results are and look up maybe some of those brand names Google them see if they have their own websites or you know if they're publicly traded companies right they're gonna have like investor relations on their site right they're gonna have probably massive following on social media right they're gonna have like a million likes on Facebook or Instagram right those are probably big brands who have a lot of marketing dollars so um, or just ask anyone right who might know that niche better than better than you but generally you know, the first thing is just common sense, right? If I think about, um, you know, if I think about, let's say, going into, I'm not going to go into computers, right? Or again, even if it was easy to produce, I'm not going to go into computers because when I think about computers, I think about HP and Apple and IBM and, you know, a bunch of Dell and a bunch of brands. So you probably would think of a brand right away. So the first thing you want to really ask yourself is, is this brand dominated? Um, certain categories of clothing, could be in the same category, right? Um, like shoes, for example, right? I probably wouldn't bring a shoe to the market because again, when you think about shoes, you could probably you could probably name five to 10 brands right off the bat without even thinking, right? So generally not a category of product that I would wanna go into. Now the exception might be if you have a really niche product within that maybe, so maybe a really niche shoe that serves a specific function or a look, yeah. whereas like a general purpose running shoe or basketball shoe, that's where I think you're going to have trouble. But if it's a really niche and targeted yeah. keyword, so maybe that's think about, think about, for example, um, they make shoes that are specifically for people with diabetes, right? Who have problems walking with cushions and whatever. And there are some brands that do that, but that's going to be more of a niche and you're probably less likely to find major brands dominating because major brands, a lot of times will not go into the niches, um, which, you know, as Andy says, the riches are in the niches. Um, and the reason is, Major brands don't go there. You know why? Because a major brand, you know, I just spoke to um, 
Uh, so interesting conversation I had today with a guy who um, is doing e-commerce and doing Amazon, but he manages e-commerce for a major, major brand that actually owns about 200 brands. And his job there was to come up with innovative ideas for different markets they could go into. And, you know, we look to, we look to go into a market where we can get to a brand to like, you know, a million dollar sales plus. Well, his criteria was if the market wasn't a hundred million potential, they wouldn't go into it. Right. So, you know, that brand is not going to go into diabetic shoes because there isn't that hundred million dollar potential. But what if there's five to 10 million potential? That's a great area for us to go into. And, you know, that leads into why the niches are in the riches, right? Uh, or the riches are in the niches. Um, that's a very good reason why private label sellers should go into those niches because they're generally not going to be brand dominated. There's not enough of a market for a hundred million dollars, but there is, there is a $20 million market or 30 million that a whole bunch of brands can, smaller brands can share. Um, so that's number one. You really need to think about, is this a brand dominated uh, category? Liron, I want to real quickly to ask Andy. Um, I know that he has a product that he did go up against a pretty big brand. Um, and maybe you can just explain, Andy, why in that case of, of your product, you felt like there still was an opportunity, even though you were going up against a brand that most people were familiar with. Yeah, so a couple of things. One, one this uh, particular product was not very saturated on Amazon. And so the brand that we're going up against, they uh, sell in multiple categories. Uh, and so um, even though they're a big brand, the particular product that I, I'm private labeling is relatively new to the market. And so that so, is one exception. So, so let me see if I can get this, like the brand, you might not necessarily think of that product and think of that brand necessarily, even though the brand is familiar, it's not like just that one product is what they're known for and what everyone thinks of. Unlike yeah. a phone, you think of iPhone, right? Apple, but you don't necessarily think of your private label product when you think of that brand. Is that yeah, correct? So, yeah. And to, to me, um, just to jump in here, I think that's the difference, right? So let's say I'm selling this, you know, sort of paper, paper cup, right? I'm drinking tea and there is a, um, let's say Lennox, right? Let's say it's a glass cup and Lennox sells this glass too, right? But chances are, if I say to you, hey, um, do you know some major brands that sell this? You might not know a major brand. And if you see Lennox there, as long as the page is not full of 10 Lennoxes, right? 10 big brands like that, you're fine, right? So if there's one Lennox, we can go up against them, right? We can beat them just like Andy did. So in Andy's case, there's sort of only really one major brand. And two, not everybody knows that brand. And it's not saturated, so you can go into compete. You don't think of it right away. So I don't, I don't mind if you know, on the first page of Amazon, maybe there's one, there's one brand, right? Not everyone maybe knows about that brand or you don't think about that brand right away. Um, or I can come in and differentiate, which is what Andy did. Andy, you know, um, the brand that Andy goes up against has like three and a half stars. Andy made improvements and made it like a five star product. So there are times when, um, like we say, we can go up against big brands and we can, uh, read the negative reviews of those big brands and come up and make a better product. But I, I wouldn't go into something that you think of a major brand right away and that the entire face, first page is not only dominated by one major brand, it's, it's dominated by five, six, seven brands, right? That's, that's the difference, I think. Awesome. I, I think that helps me, you know, just conceptualize it a little better. If you're listening to this and, and that helps, uh, leave us a comment on, if you're listening on YouTube, if you're listening on the podcast, you can leave a comment on our website or in our Facebook group. Let us know if it's still not a little bit clear about um, what the difference is, because, you know, sometimes it can feel a little bit restrictive when you say you can't go up against a brand, but when, you know, the way that Lee Ron just put it, I think, explains it a little bit better. We just want to be careful not to go up against too saturated, dominated by a brand niche, but there are still thousands and thousands I mean, of opportunities you know, out there. There's a, you know, I'll give us an example and it's not a, not a category, category I can go into, but uh, I would go into, but there are major, uh, there are major brands who sell, let's say, um, lightning cords, right? For your phone, like Apple. But at the same time, there are tons of private label brands on Amazon that do really, really well. Now that category at this point, I think is saturated and I wouldn't go into it. But if you had started, gotten into that product, maybe, you know, four or five years ago, started building like some cell phone accessories, then maybe you have, you know, you're doing well and you have, and you have a chance and you're still competing up against big brands. There's also enough uh, demand to 
create, you know, to create the uh, the attention and and the brands aren't doing anything so special in that category, right? So um, there are times when you can go up against brands, but you don't want to go into something that's completely brand dominated and you're going to be the one or two private label products in that niche. Awesome. So number one is avoiding uh, niches or products that are too brand dominated. Uh, the rest of the uh, the rest of the four, Liron. Yep. So, um, you know, I think you have to understand that Amazon, it's all about the data, um, which, you know, you're asking, uh, you're asking Andy, you know, should you go into a product that you don't know? And um, the reason why Andy said like, or only products that you know, and the reason why Andy said, um, no, you should look at other products is because when it comes to Amazon, we have the best seller rank and we can understand how many sales uh, products are getting. And because we have that data, we can have the confidence to go into products that we don't really fully understand, but we can learn to understand as we import them and understand what customers want. So I would, I would say you want to use tools. Um, the tool we like to use is market intelligence as a, as a way to really make sure that you're analyzing the data. Don't fall in love with a product. Don't get emotional attachment to a product. It might not be the right product for Amazon. Don't back into a product. Um, I had somebody messaging me this week, um, and they said to me, they have some connection to family in Peru that is, they're able to get this product, right? Well, so what, right? Just because you have this connection, you're able to get a product doesn't mean anything. You need to look at the data. And we basically have connections to all these manufacturers that we use for our private label products uh, from China, right? Or we basically have connections at this point. That's what yep. Alibaba and these sources have opened up to us are these connections that we don't have to know some uncle or family member in India or Peru, right? Because we're able to basically have these same type of connections where honestly, the price isn't probably going to be that much better. They have a, yeah. a base manufacturing cost, right? Yeah. So the only time I would think is it's an advantage is if that country or, you know, you can get something that's unique that is not made in China, that is mm. not, you know, if you can bring something in from India, that's kind of special to that country that they know, or they make a lot better or a lot cheaper. Um, you know, I know. And, and, and it might not be available readily on a big, uh, B2B Alibaba, marketplace right. like yeah like Alibaba and, right. and it has to have customer demand so I know Andy um, you know somebody who had um, gotten into the amazing freedom course when uh, a few years ago um, was somebody in India and I know Andy partnered up with him to source some unique products from India that you could not really find through Alibaba and that was a major advantage but there was customer demand for those products and I think that's the key that you need to look at so number two would be uh, Analyze, uh, you know, having a tool like like a market intelligence to really look at the data um, on Amazon. Uh, we can go into number three. Yep. Um, so number three kind of leads in for number two, which is, um, well, what do you want to do with a tool like a market intelligence, right? Um, what is it really good for? So when you run the tool on the page, one of the things that you really want to look at is what are sales like, right? Um, and Leroy, if I can just tell you there, because yeah, I think a lot of people have these product research tools at this point, maybe if, not if you're just getting into private label, but if you have been probably looked at extensions like Jungle Scout or Market Intelligence. However, having an extension or seeing it and actually knowing how to interpret the information, the data that's on there is a whole different story, right? And that's kind of what you're talking about here. Yeah, the data is only as good as the person who's analyzing the data, right? The tools are only as good. Um, I don't know how to shoot a gun. So if you gave me a gun, I probably wouldn't hit the target, right? But if you've been practicing with a gun and you know what you're doing, you're gonna hit the target, right? So it's kind of like the same, the same thing. So, um, you know, number two is really looking at the, number three is really looking at the sales on the first page. And what you want is you wanna have depth. And what I mean by depth is you wanna have sales on the first page that are not just concentrated between one or two you know, brands, one or two products on the first page, you want to have sales that go deep on the first page, right? Where people don't just click on the first listing, the second listing, the third listing, because you really have no guarantee that you're going to be in the top three listings. But, you know, if you're targeting the right keyword and product, then you can do it. If you do a good job, you can get to the first page. And so if you see that there's a good amount of sales on the first page, then you know, and, and what I mean by good amount, I mean sellers that are selling 7,000, 8,000 a month, 10,000 a month, 15,000 a month, right? Um, if you see sellers at the top of the page selling 10, 20, 30,000 a month, but you know, towards the middle and bottom, most of the sellers are at like 1,000 or less or 2,000, it's probably not a product that, or at least not a keyword that you're gonna wanna target. You're gonna need to look and see if there's other major main keywords for that, for that product. So you wanna have depth because you know if I land on the first page, 
I'll be able to get some of those sales um, and maybe not an equal share with everybody else. Maybe I can make my product better. Maybe I can make my listing better. Um, I can differentiate, which we'll talk about. And maybe I can actually grab, if I can grab 10% market share from all these other listings on the first page, then I know um, I can have some significant sales based on that keyword. So uh, number three would be depth in terms of sales. Um, number four um, would be looking at the reviews. So um, the nice thing about the market intelligence tool is that it has something called the review ratio, um, sales to review and review ratio. So we'll talk about that. Um, but one of the things I look at is, you know, the top listings on the page, um, the top three to five listings, how many reviews do they have? If they all have 500 plus, you know, or a thousand reviews, then um, I, I'm going to be concerned that I may not get the clicks, right? And, you know, that kind of goes in line with depth. The chances are that if the top few listings have a ton of reviews, then they're going to capture most of the sales and it's probably not going to have the, the level of depth that you want. Or it means that the entire first page has, if you have the depth, it means probably that most of the first page, um, you know, you, that, that it could be that it's because a lot of the listings on the first page have a lot of reviews. What you, what you really want is you want the, you know, the top listings not to have more than like 500 plus reviews generally. Um, because they're going to capture a lot of the sales and clicks if they do, especially if they're good reviews, right? If they're not good reviews, then I wouldn't be really as concerned uh, if I knew I could produce a better quality product. Some niches just don't have as good reviews as others. You'll see this in cell phone cases. You'll see this in certain certain electronics products. You'll see like three stars is the norm. So if, if they have that and that's the norm, then that is a concern. So uh, you want to look at that. And you also want to see some successful products on the first page with like a hundred or less reviews, right? That means that if, I, if I'm if i sitting on the first page next to somebody, it's kind of like a, it's like a beauty contest, right? If I'm sitting and I'm right next to me on the first page is a product that has, um, you know, 60 reviews or 50 reviews and I have 10 or 15, I could probably get the click, right? I'm almost just as good as long as I have good reviews. It's not a major difference, but if somebody looks and says, wow, a thousand reviews, they click, right? And I know when I look at products on Amazon, it's social proof which we've done, you know, we've done some uh, podcasts about too, about social proof and uh, that being one of the triggers of human psychology. If I see a thousand reviews, I'm like, oh yes, everyone's buying this product. I'm going to click and buy it. And I don't need to think too much, right? Because we don't, we want the decisions to be made for us. So um, that's another thing I would look at. And along Leron, with this, that, this yep. is kind of a tricky one though, for most people, right? Because it, it does depend on the niche. It does depend on the product. There's, there's, probably more factors that go into the reviews and some of these other uh, topics that we're talking about because it's not like sales velocity where we can get pretty good numbers from market intelligence, for example, that show us exactly how much demand is there, especially if you look historically and seasonally, right? But in this case, it, it kind of depends, right? Every niche yeah. is different. It depends on the quality of the reviews and how many and how fast a review ratio yeah. you can get. So it, it is a, a little bit more challenging, right? There's definitely an art and science to it. If, if, there, if there wasn't then you would let computers pick their products for you, right? But you need you need some human decision making to uh, as part of it, and you need some you need some like you need to be able to analyze and look at it. But one of the things that market intelligence does give you is a sales to review ratio, right? And so, what is sales to reviews? Well, ratio. So you know, if a product is selling a thousand units a month, right? You want to look at the units and you want to look at the reviews. If a thousand is selling, if a product is selling a thousand units a month and has a thousand reviews, then the sales to review ratio is one, right? A thousand reviews, a thousand units. But what if that product is selling um, a thousand units um, and has only a hundred reviews, right? Now the sales to review ratio is 10. That means I need only hundred reviews, I can get 10 times my uh, reviews in terms of sales. That means if I come in and in theory and I have uh, 30 reviews, then I can get 300 sales, right? As opposed to 30 sales. So the more products on the first page that have a um, ratio at least higher than like two or three of sales to reviews means that um, I can come in and I don't need a lot of reviews to compete. Nero, right. let me ask you this. What about um, certain niches or keywords where people yeah. might think that there's people that are not getting their reviews in an honest or, or organic way, right? Maybe they are paying other people to, to give them reviews, right? So is that something that you're trying to look out for when you're doing yeah. your research? And how yeah. does it affect your decision there? 
Yes, it is, you know, so for example, um, you need to, you know, sometimes it's kind of looking, you know, um, peeling the onion, right? And going in, going in a step deeper and analyzing the results. So if you see a product that has like a review ratio of like 30 or 40, right? If you see a bunch of those on a page and suddenly you look at it and you look at the Keepa chart or you look at the first date available on Amazon and, you know, a product has like 200 reviews and it's been on Amazon for like 15 days, then, you know, there's probably, um, unless they did Kickstarter or some kind of crazy something, then, you know, there's probably some review manipulation going on. And then you sort of have to discount out that um, that review ratio of that being a, a signal that it's a good opportunity just because of that. So you do need to, um, you know, I know when I was in, in management, uh, in bank management, we always had, we always had to say, you look at the numbers, but then you have to peel the onion, right? You have to look beyond just the numbers of what's really behind it and to understand the story of, of what's going on. And so, you know, I think with, with everything on Amazon, you need, you know, the numbers are, the numbers help and the data helps, but you need to do analysis. So um, yeah, you would definitely want to consider that. And there's going to be certain niches like maybe supplements, like I would say the beauty category, um, really sort of very competitive category, supplements, very competitive category. Um, you're going to have to look, um, probably do a little bit, go a little bit deeper in terms of your, um, your research. Um, and then um, let's talk about the last item. The last item is, you know, asking yourself um, a couple of questions. And the first question is, why would somebody buy from me, right? So if you have, uh, if you're bringing a product to market and it's the exact same as everybody else on the first page, and they already, there are products that are doing well with 60 and 70 and 100 reviews, well, why would somebody now click and buy your product um, instead of that one, right? And it shouldn't, the answer shouldn't be price. I can get it in a lower price because, you know, what's going to happen when, um, you come in at 20 bucks and your competitors at 25. Well, they might drop their price, right? To beat you out of the market, right? I know Andy, um, Andy, you did the same thing, right? You had some competitors come in. You, um, um, you know, I think you increased your sponsored ads like crazy for a month. You lowered your price a little bit and you knocked them out, right? And they didn't come back because they didn't get the sales and they didn't replenish their, their product, right? I mean, it's pretty much what, what you've done in, in those cases. So, that's because the competitors that came in against you didn't come in with any differentiation, right? They just came in and maybe they dropped the price by five bucks and they probably didn't have the budget that you did to go crazy on sponsored ads because it was a new product for them. And so they didn't have the proven sales history to want to protect it the way you did. And so you upped your budget, you spent five to 10 grand on that product in sponsored ads and you knocked them out. And that's, you know, that's kind of, that's the stuff that sellers will do on Amazon, right? You want to protect your brand. And, and let's talk about real quick, since we're on that subject, because I think this is a real golden nugget that people need to utilize if they have the bank account to do it. I had the bank account and I was willing to spend money. I knew this was a proven product. I knew the customer demand was there. And so I was able to up, like you said, my PPC. I knew once I got into those top spots that my sales were going to continue. Now, I, I, no, this is the, not, uh, I didn't uh, only do sponsored ads, but I also decreased my price because you know, this is definitely the competitive nature in me. I wanted to punk my competitors and let them know, you know, that I want that I was going to take that spot and I was willing to do whatever it took because I knew I had in my mind that if I spent this amount of money that through Amazon's algorithm and because remember when you're dropping your price, those customers are searching organically. That's moving your listing up through organic search. That is what Amazon loves the most. Giveaways are great. When we launch our products, it works. It works. But what Amazon loves the most are those organic search bought with by full price. And so by bumping it up like that, again, and by willing to do that, I was able to capitalize on those top positions. And now my price is back to where it needs to be. My margins are great. And I'm winning. But I definitely went in with that long game attitude. And, you know, I remember one of the things that you told me that you did too, which was you raise your bid on PPC, right? So you, you raise your bid to like six, seven bucks and they're competing for the same keywords. Now they're like, what the heck is going on? I'm paying six bucks a click, right? In this niche, like this is crazy. I can't spend this money to be in this market, right? And, and my guess is at that point, once they do sell it, they're like, they're really considering to themselves, wow, am I going to reorder another 500,000 units to compete with this, with this person who's willing to do this, right? And at that point, if they don't, you're, you're pushing them out. <laughs> right. 
exactly. And so, you know, this is really why you need to ask yourself, right? It leads us back to, and this is a good defensive strategy, right? When somebody comes into your niche, you want to bump them out. But, you know, it's also why you need to differentiate your product because had Andy's competitor been smart and come up with something different, then Andy dropping the price would not have affected it as much, right? Because maybe now they bundled it with something he wasn't offering, or maybe they came in with something unique or different where him just lowering the price wouldn't necessarily be as effective, right? And so you need to ask yourself, why would somebody buy from me and how can I differentiate the product, which you know really comes down to, and I think this is also why Andy was able to beat that big brand because you know I think you read like all the negative reviews on this on this brand and you were able to make improvements to the product while they're asleep at the wheel. And so when you are able to differentiate your product, um, look at the negative reviews, talk to your supplier about how can we make a better product, how can we improve? And sometimes it's only like 50 cents more for better material, right? It could be really, really cheap um, to make, make a product with better materials. Um, you're able to come in and compete because you've differentiated your product. And now somebody has a very good reason why they might buy your product with a, with one review versus somebody who has 50 reviews because you've made it, you've made it different. Um, whether that's, um, you know, unbelievable packaging, um, which isn't necessarily easy for somebody to just make a quick change. Um, that's, you know, sort of a simpler thing, but really a change to the design look of a product or a change to the materials of a product. Um, now you're able to come in and compete with that person that has a hundred reviews because your product is different. So these five things, I think are really important before you pull the trigger on a product you um, you know and and you know you you can you can look at and decide and these are the things that we also look at when we do our you know product evaluation guides for people in our inner circle group we look at all these things and we say okay you know did you know does this product does this idea have enough here is did do we can we check off all the boxes right on these criteria and that's what you want to be able to do you want to check off all the boxes um, get a sample, make sure you have a good quality product, and then create a great listing. And that's going to be your recipe for, um, I think, as good a chance as you have to have a successful product launch on Amazon. Awesome. Well, you know, I think those pieces, no matter how many times you may have heard something similar, or maybe you've heard the opposite of some of this, right? I know there's a lot of information out there, sometimes doesn't exactly um, fit what we've said here. Um, the three of us are constantly, like I said, looking to bring new products to the marketplace. Andy and Liron sell millions of dollars of their brands. Uh, we're in the trenches doing this. We think our approach is pretty good. And we think that, you know, doing a little bit different than what everybody else is doing has been working out well for us. And, and we continue to see that kind of the success driver for us uh, throughout 2018. And I just want to say, if you've been listening to us for a while, um, we're almost coming up to a year now doing the Amazon Seller Podcast. Really exciting. Uh, we actually just recently passed 100 thousand downloads, which for us was super cool to hear um, that we've had over a hundred thousand downloads of our podcast. Uh, we're looking to only grow that number in 2018, right? We're doing a couple of cool things. Uh, we're going to start doing actually some live uh, Amazon seller podcast episodes on YouTube. We'll, we'll still have the recording on iTunes, but if you go to amazingfreedom.com slash YouTube, you can subscribe to our channel so that you'll get notified when we have these new episodes that are live. What that's going to let you do is ask us some more questions in a live format, uh, allow us to get a little bit more animated and engaged with our listeners. We think that's something that's really exciting. Uh, and as we head into 2018, uh, we're going to continue to produce you know, these podcast episodes to try to give you as much value as we can. Um, if you haven't yet, you're really going to want to go to amazingfreedom.com slash Facebook and join our group as well. Uh, Lee Ron, at the time I'm recording this, actually just today released a whiteboard video that he does in his office periodically, usually on a weekly or biweekly basis where he shows some really good tips in a format right on a whiteboard where he's writing it down. And so it's really easy to follow and you can get a little bit more engagement um, or visualization than you can sometimes on the podcast. But we're going to continue to do um, audio options as well. So we really appreciate everyone who's been listening. I just wanted to say that as we kind of get into some of our first episode of the new year, we're extremely optimistic of uh, Amazon and private label in 2018. We see really awesome things happening in our own businesses, the businesses of our uh, inner circle members, and for those who are following us throughout our training and these podcast episodes and our videos. So a big thank you to everyone who's been listening. Um, I'm excited. Thank you, Andy and Liron. We're going to have some really great stuff coming out for you guys coming up. Stay tuned and thanks for listening to the Amazon Seller Podcast. 
You've been listening to the Amazon Seller Podcast. Make sure to subscribe and join us next time for another look at how to dominate the Amazon marketplace.